Chapter One, Part One of The Haunted Man and the Ghost's Bargain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Haunted Man and the Ghost's Bargain by Charles Dickens. Chapter One The Gift Bestowed everybody said so far be it from me to assert that what everybody says must be true everybody is often as likely to be wrong as right in the general experience everybody has been wrong so often and it has taken in most instances such a weary while to find out how wrong that the authority is proved to be fallible everybody may sometimes be right but that's no rule as the ghost of giles scroggins says in the ballad the dread word ghost recalls me everybody said he looked like a haunted man the extent of my present claim for everybody is that they were so far right he did who could have seen his hollow cheek his sunken, brilliant eye, his black-attired figure indefinably grim, although well-knit and well-proportioned, his grizzled hair hanging like tangled seaweed about his face, as if he had been through his whole life a lonely mark for the chafing and beating of the great deep of humanity, but might have said he looked like a haunted man. Who could have observed his manner, taciturn thoughtful gloomy shadowed by habitual reserve retiring always and jocund never with a distraught air of reverting to a bygone place and time or of listening to some old echoes in his mind but might have said it was the manner of a haunted man who could have heard his voice slow speaking deep and grave with a natural fullness and melody in it which he seemed to set himself against and stop, but might have said it was the voice of a haunted man. Who that had seen him in his inner chamber, part library and part laboratory, for he was, as the world knew, far and wide, a learned man in chemistry, and a teacher on whose lips and hands a crowd of aspiring ears and eyes hung daily. Who that had seen him there upon a winter night, alone, surrounded by his drugs and instruments and books, the shadow of his shaded lamp a monstrous beetle on the wall, motionless among a crowd of spectral shapes, raised there by the flickering of the fire upon the quaint objects around him? Some of these phantoms, the reflection of glass vessels that held liquids, trembling at heart like things that knew his power to uncombine them and to give back their component parts to fire and vapour who that had seen him then his work done and he pondering in his chair before the rusted grate and red flame moving his thin mouth as if in speech but silent as the dead would not have said that the man seemed haunted and the chamber too who might not by a very easy flight of fancy have believed that everything about him took this haunted tone and that he lived on haunted ground his dwelling was so solitary and vault-like an old retired part of an ancient endowment for students once a brave edifice planted in an open place but now the obsolete whim of forgotten architects, smoke, age, and weather darkened, squeezed on every side by the overgrowing of the great city, and choked like an old well with stones and bricks. Its small quadrangles, lying down in very pits, formed by the streets and buildings, which in course of time had been constructed above its heavy chimney-stacks, its old trees insulted by the neighbouring smoke which deigned to droop so low when it was very feeble and the weather very moody 
its grass plots struggling with the mildewed earth to be grass or to win any show of compromise, its silent pavements unaccustomed to the tread of feet and even to the observation of eyes, except when a stray face looked down from the upper world wondering what nook it was, its sundial in a little bricked-up corner where no sun had straggled for a hundred years, but where, in compensation for the sun's neglect, the snow would lie for weeks when it lay nowhere else, and the black east wind would spin like a huge humming-top when in all other places it was silent and still. His dwelling, at its heart and core, within doors at his fireside, was so lowering and old, so crazy, yet so strong, with its worm-eaten beams of wood in the ceiling, and its sturdy floor shelving downward to the great oak chimney-piece, so environed and hemmed in by the pressure of the town, yet so remote in fashion, age, and custom, so quiet, yet so thundering with echoes when a distant voice was raised or a door was shut, Echoes not confined to the many low passages and empty rooms, but rumbling and grumbling till they were stifled in the heavy air of the forgotten crypt, where the Norman arches were half buried in the earth. You should have seen him in his dwelling about twilight, in the dead winter time when the wind was blowing shrill and shrewd with the going down of the blurred sun, when it was just so dark as that the forms of things were indistinct and big, but not wholly lost, when sitters by the fire began to see wild faces and figures, mountains and abysses, ambuscades and armies in the coals, when people in the streets bent down their heads and ran before the weather, when those who were obliged to meet it were stopped at angry corners, stung by wandering snowflakes alighting on the lashes of their eyes, which fell too sparingly and were blown away too quickly to leave a trace upon the frozen ground, when windows of private houses closed up tight and warm, when lighted gas began to burst forth in the busy and the quiet streets, fast blackening otherwise, when stray pedestrians shivering along the latter looked down at the glowing fires in kitchens and sharpened their sharp appetites by sniffing up the fragrance of whole miles of dinners, when travellers by land were bitter cold and looked wearily on gloomy landscapes rustling and shuddering in the blast, when mariners at sea, outlying upon icy yards, were tossed and swung above the howling ocean dreadfully, when lighthouses on rocks and headlands showed solitary and watchful, and benighted sea-birds breasted on against their ponderous lanterns and fell dead when little readers of story-books by the firelight trembled to think of Cassim Baba cut into quarters, hanging in the robber's cave, or had some small misgivings that the fierce little old woman with the crutch, who used to start out of the box in the merchant Abuda's bedroom, might one of these nights be found upon the stairs in the long, cold, dusky journey up to bed when in rustic places the last glimmering of daylight died away from the ends of avenues, and the trees arching overhead were sullen and black, when in parks and woods the high wet fern and sodden moss and beds of fallen leaves and trunks of trees were lost to view in masses of impenetrable shade, when mists arose from dyke and fen and river when lights in old halls and in cottage windows were a cheerful sight, when the mill stopped, the wheelwright and the blacksmith shut their workshops, the turnpike gate closed, the plough and harrow were left lonely in the fields, the labourer and team went home, and the striking of the church clock had a deeper sound than at noon, and the churchyard wicket would be swung no more that night. 
when twilight everywhere released the shadows prisoned up all day that now closed in and gathered like mustering swarms of ghosts when they stood lowering in corners of rooms and frowned out from behind half-opened doors when they had full possession of unoccupied apartments, when they danced upon the floors and walls and ceilings of inhabited chambers while the fire was low, and withdrew like ebbing waters when it sprung into a blaze, when they fantastically mocked the shapes of household objects, making the nurse an ogress, the rocking horse a monster, the wandering child, half scared and half amused, a stranger to itself, the very tongs upon the hearth, a straddling giant with his arms akimbo, evidently smelling the blood of Englishmen and wanting to grind people's bones to make his bread. When these shadows brought into the minds of older people other thoughts and showed them different images, when they stole from their retreats in the likenesses of forms and faces from the past, from the grave, from the deep, deep gulf where the things that might have been and never were are always wandering. When he sat, as already mentioned, gazing at the fire, when, as it rose and fell, the shadows went and came, when he took no heed of them with his bodily eyes, but, let them come or let them go, looked fixedly at the fire, you should have seen him then. When the sounds that had arisen with the shadows and come out of their lurking places at the twilight summons seemed to make a deeper stillness all about him, when the wind was rumbling in the chimney and sometimes crooning, sometimes howling in the house, when the old trees outside were so shaken and beaten that one querulous old rook, unable to sleep, protested now and then in a feeble, dozy, high up, Gah! when at intervals the window trembled, the rusty vein upon the turret top complained, the clock beneath it recorded that another quarter of an hour was gone, or the fire collapsed and fell in with a rattle. When a knock came at his door, in short, as he was sitting so, and roused him. Who's that? said he. Come in. Surely there had been no figure leaning on the back of his chair no face looking over it. It is certain that no gliding footstep touched the floor as he lifted up his head with a start and spoke. And yet there was no mirror in the room on whose surface his own form could have cast its shadow for a moment, and something had passed darkly and gone. I'm humbly fearful, sir said a fresh-coloured busy man holding the door open with his foot for the admission of himself and a wooden tray he carried and letting it go again by very gentle and careful degrees when he and the tray had got in lest it should close noisily that it's a good bit past the time to-night but mrs william has been taken off her legs so often by the wind ay i have heard it rising by the wind sir that it's a mercy she got home at all Oh, dear, yes. Yes, it was by the wind, Mr. Redlaw, by the wind. He had by this time put down the tray for dinner, and was employed in lighting the lamp and spreading a cloth on the table. From this employment he desisted in a hurry to stir and feed the fire, and then resumed it. The lamp he had lighted, and the blaze that rose under his hand so quickly changing the appearance of the room, that it seemed as if the mere coming in of his fresh red face and active manner had made the pleasant alteration. "'Mrs. William is, of course, subject at any time, sir, to be taken off her balance by the elements. She is not formed superior to that.' "'No,' returned Mr. Redlaw, good-naturedly, though abruptly. 
No, sir, Mrs. William may be taken off her balance by earth, as, for example, last Sunday week, when sloppy and greasy, and she going out to tea with her newest sister-in-law and having a pride in herself and wishing to appear perfectly spotless, though pedestrian, Mrs. William may be taken off her balance by air, as being once over-persuaded by a friend to try a swing at Peckham Fair, which acted on her constitution instantly like a steamboat. Mrs. William may be taken off her balance by fire, as on a false alarm of engines at her mother's when she went two miles in her nightcap. Mrs. William may be taken off her balance by water, as at Battersea when rowed into the piers by her young nephew Charlie Swidger, Jr., aged twelve, which had no idea of boats whatever. But these are elements. Mrs. William must be taken out of elements for the strength of her character to come into play. As he stopped for a reply, the reply was, Yes, in the same tone as before. Yes, sir, oh dear, yes, said Mr. Swidger, still proceeding with his preparations and checking them off as he made them. That's where it is, sir. That's what I always say myself, sir. Such a many of us Swidgers. Pepper. Why, there's my father, sir, superannuated keeper and custodian of this institution, eighty-seven year old. He's a Swidger. Spoon. True, William, was the patient and abstracted answer when he stopped again. Yes, sir said Mr. Swidger. That's what I always say, sir. You may call him the trunk of the tree, bread. Then you come to his successor, my unworthy self, salt, and Mrs. William, Swidger's both, knife and fork. Then you come to all my brothers and their families, Swidger's man and woman, boy and girl. Why, what with cousins, uncles, aunts, and relationships of this, that, and t'other degree, and what not degree, and marriages, and lyings in, the Swidgers, tumblers, might take hold of hands and make a ring round England. Receiving no reply at all here from the thoughtful man whom he addressed, Mr. William approached him nearer, and made a feint of accidentally knocking the table with a decanter to rouse him. The moment he succeeded, he went on, as if in great alacrity of acquiescence. Yes, sir, that's just what I say myself, sir. Mrs. William and me have often said so. There's swidgers enough, we say, without our voluntary contributions. Butter. In fact, sir, my father is a family in himself, casters to take care of, and it happens all for the best that we have no child of our own, though it's made Mrs. William rather quiet-like, too. Are quite ready for the fowl and mashed potatoes, sir. Mrs. William said she'd dish in ten minutes when I left the lodge. I am quite ready, said the other, waking as from a dream and walking slowly to and fro. Mrs. William has been at it again, sir said the keeper, as he stood warming a plate at the fire and pleasantly shading his face with it. Mr. Redlaw stopped in his walking, and an expression of interest appeared in him. "'What I always say myself, sir, she will do it. There's a motherly feeling in Mrs. William's breast that must and will have went.' "'What has she done?' Why, sir, not satisfied with being a sort of mother to all the young gentlemen that come up from a variety of parts to attend your courses of lectures at this ancient foundation. It's surprising how Stone Chaney catches the heat this frosty weather, to be sure. Here he turned the plate and cooled his fingers. Well, said Mr. Redlaw, that's just what I say myself, sir returned Mr. William, speaking over his shoulder as if in ready and delighted assent. That's exactly where it is, sir. There ain't one of our students but appears to regard Mrs. William in that light. Every day, right through the course, they put their heads into the lodge one after another, and have all got something to tell her or something to ask her. Swidge is the appellation by which they speak of Mrs. William in general among themselves, I'm told. But that's what I say, sir. Better be called ever so far out of your name if it's done in real liking than have it made ever so much of and not cared about. What's a name for? To know a person by. 
If Mrs. William is known by something better than her name, I allude to Mrs. William's qualities and disposition, never mind her name, though it is Swidger by rights. Let em call her Swidge, Widge, Bridge, Lord, <laughs> London Bridge, Blackfriars, Chelsea Putney, Waterloo, or Hammersmith Suspension, if they like. The close of this triumphant oration brought him and the plate to the table, upon which he half laid and half dropped it with a lively sense of its being thoroughly heated, just as the subject of his praises entered the room, bearing another tray and a lantern, and followed by a venerable old man with long grey hair. Mrs. William, like Mr. William, was a simple, innocent-looking person, in whose smooth cheeks the cheerful red of her husband's official waistcoat was very pleasantly repeated. But whereas Mr. William's light hair stood on end all over his head, and seemed to draw his eyes up with it in an excess of bustling readiness for anything, the dark brown hair of Mrs. William was carefully smoothed down and waved away under a trim, tidy cap, in the most exact and quiet manner imaginable. Whereas Mr. William's very trousers hitched themselves up at the ankles as if it were not in their iron-grey nature to rest without looking about them, Mrs. William's neatly flowered skirts, red and white like her own pretty face, were as composed and orderly as if the very wind that blew so hard out of doors could not disturb one of their folds. Whereas his coat had something of a fly-away and half-off appearance about the collar and breast, her little bodice was so placid and neat that there should have been protection for her in it had she needed any with the roughest people. Who could have had the heart to make so calm a bosom swell with grief, or throb with fear, or flutter with a thought of shame? To whom would its repose and peace have not appealed against disturbance, like the innocent slumber of a child? Punctual, of course, Milly, said her husband, relieving her of the tray, or it wouldn't be you. Here's Mrs. William, sir. He looks lonelier than ever to-night, whispering to his wife as he was taking the tray, and ghostlier altogether. Without any show of hurry or noise, or any show of herself even, she was so calm and quiet, Milly set the dishes she had brought upon the table. Mr. William, after much clattering and running about, having only gained possession of a butterboat of gravy, which he stood ready to serve. "'What is that the old man has in his arms?' asked Mr. Redlaw as he sat down to his solitary meal. "'Holly, sir,' replied the quiet voice of Milly. "'That's what I say myself, sir,' interposed Mr. William, striking in with the butterboat. "'Berries is so seasonable to the time of year. Brown gravy. "'Another Christmas come, another year gone.' murmured the chemist with a gloomy sigh. More figures in the lengthening sum of recollection that we work and work at to our torment, till death idly jumbles altogether and rubs all out. So, Philip, breaking off and raising his voice as he addressed the old man, standing apart with his glistening burden in his arms, from which the quiet Mrs. William took small branches, which she noiselessly trimmed with her scissors and decorated the room with, while her aged father-in-law looked on much interested in the ceremony. "'My duty to you, sir,' returned the old man. "'Should have spoke before, sir, but know your ways, Mr. Redlaw, proud to say, and wait till spoke to. Merry Christmas, sir.' and happy new year and many of em have had a pretty many of em myself <laughs> and may take the liberty of wishing em i'm eighty-seven have you had so many that were merry and happy asked the other ay sir ever so many returned the old man is his memory impaired with age it is to be expected now said Mr. Redlaw, turning to the son and speaking lower. "'Not a morsel of it, sir,' replied Mr. William. 
"'That's exactly what I say myself, sir. "'There never was such a memory as my father's. "'He's the most wonderful man in the world. "'He don't know what forgetting means. "'It's the very observation I'm always making to Mrs. Williams, sir, "'if you'll believe me.' Mr. Swidger, in his polite desire to seem to acquiesce at all events, delivered this as if there were no iota of contradiction in it, and it were all said in unbounded and unqualified assent. The chemist pushed his plate away, and, rising from the table, walked across the room to where the old man stood, looking at a little sprig of holly in his hand. "'It recalls the time when many of those years were old and new then,' he said observing him attentively and touching him on the shoulder. "'Does it?' "'Oh, many, many,' said Philip, half awaking from his reverie. "'I'm eighty-seven. "'Merry and happy, was it?' asked the chemist in a low voice. "'Merry and happy, old man?' "'Maybe as high as that, no higher.' said the old man, holding out his hand a little way above the level of his knee, and looking retrospectively at his questioner. "'When I first remember em, cold sunshiny day it was out a walking, when someone—it was my mother as sure as you stand there, though I don't know what her blessed face was like, for she took ill and died that Christmas time told me they were food for birds. The pretty little fellow thought, that's me, you understand, that birds' eyes were so bright, perhaps, because the berries they lived on in the winter were so bright. I recollect that, and I'm eighty-seven. Merry and happy, mused the other, bending his dark eyes upon the stooping figure with a smile of compassion. Merry and happy, and remember well. Ay, 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 resumed the old man, catching the last words. I remember em well in my school time, year after year, and all the merry-making that used to come along with them. I was a strong chap then, Mr. Redlaw, and, if you'll believe me, hadn't my match at football within ten mile. Where's my son, William? Hadn't my match at football, William, within ten mile? That's what I always say, father, returned the son promptly and with great respect. You are a swidger, if ever there was one of the family. Dear, said the old man, shaking his head as he again looked at the holly. His mother, my son William's my youngest son, and I have sat among em all, boys and girls, little children and babies, many a year, when the berries like these were not shining off so bright all round us as their bright faces. Many of em are gone, she's gone, and my son George, our eldest, who was her pride more than all the rest, is fallen very low. But I can see them when I look here, alive and healthy as they used to be in those days. And I can see him, thank God, in his innocence. It's a blessed thing to me at eighty-seven. The keen look that had been fixed upon him with so much earnestness had gradually sought the ground. "'When my circumstances got to be not so good as formerly through not being honestly dealt by, and I first come here to be custodian,' said the old man, "'which was upwards of fifty years ago. Where's my son William? More than half a century ago, William?' "'That's what I say, father,' replied the son, as promptly and dutifully as before. "'That's exactly where it is. Two times oughts and ought, and twice five ten, and there's a hundred of them.' "'It was quite a pleasure to know that one of our founders, or more correctly speaking,' said the old man, with a great glory in his subject and his knowledge of it, one of the learned gentlemen that helped endow us in Queen Elizabeth's time, for we were founded afore her day, 
left in his will among the other bequests he made us so much to buy holly for garnishing the walls and windows come christmas there was something homely and friendly in it being but strange here then and coming at christmas time we took a liking for his very picture that hangs in what used to be anciently afore our ten poor gentlemen commuted for an annual stipend in money our great dinner hall a sedate gentleman in a peaked beard with a ruff round his neck and a scroll below him in old english letters lord keep my memory green you know all about him mr redlaw i know the portrait hangs there philip yes sure it's the second on the right above the panelling i was going to say he has helped to keep my memory green i thank him for going round the building every year as i'm a-doing now and freshening up the bare rooms with these branches and berries freshens up my bare old brain one year brings back another and that year another and those others numbers at last it seems to me as if the birth time of our lord was the birth time of all i have ever had affection for or mourned for or delighted in and there are pretty many for i am eighty-seven merry and happy murmured redlaw to himself the room began to darken strangely so you see sir pursued old philip whose hale wintry cheek had warmed into a ruddier glow and whose blue eyes had brightened while he spoke i have plenty to keep when i keep this present season now where's my quiet mouse chattering's the sin of my time of life and there's half the building to do yet if the cold don't freeze us first or the wind don't blow us away or the darkness don't swallow us up the quiet mouse had brought her calm face to his side and silently taken his arm before he finished speaking come away my dear said the old man mr redlaw won't settle to his dinner otherwise till it's cold as the winter i hope you'll excuse me rambling on sir and i wish you good night and once again a merry stay said mr redlaw resuming his place at the table more it would have seemed from his manner to reassure the old keeper than in any remembrance of his own appetite spare me another moment philip william you were going to tell me something to your excellent wife's honour it will not be disagreeable to her to hear you praise her what was it why that's where it is you say sir returned mr william swidger looking towards his wife in considerable embarrassment mrs william's got her eye upon me but you're not afraid of mrs william's eye why no sir returned mr swidger that's what i say myself it wasn't made to be afraid of it wouldn't have been made so mild if that was the intention but i wouldn't like to milly him you know down in the buildings mr william standing behind the table and rummaging disconcertedly among the objects upon it directed persuasive glances at mrs william and secret jerks of his head and thumb at mr redlaw as alluring her towards him him you know my love said mr william down in the buildings tell my dear you're the works of shakespeare in comparison with myself down in the buildings you know my love student student repeated mr redlaw raising his head that's what i say sir cried mr william in the utmost animation of assent if it wasn't the poor student down in the buildings why should you wish to hear it from mrs william's lips mrs william my dear buildings i didn't know said milly with a quiet frankness free from any haste or confusion that william had said anything about it or i wouldn't have come i asked him not to it's a sick young gentleman sir 
and very poor, I am afraid, who is too ill to go home this holiday time, and lives unknown to any one in but a common kind of lodging for a gentleman down in Jerusalem buildings. That's all, sir. Why have I never heard of him? said the chemist, rising hurriedly. Why has he not made his situation known to me? Sick! Give me my hat and cloak. Poor... What house? What number? Oh, you mustn't go there, sir, said Milly, leaving her father-in-law and calmly confronting him with her collected little face and folded hands. Not go there? Oh, dear, no, said Milly, shaking her head as at a most manifest and self-evident impossibility. It couldn't be thought of. What do you mean? Why not? Why, you see, sir, said Mr. William Swidger, persuasively and confidentially, that's what I say. Depend upon it, the young gentleman would never have made his situation known to one of his own sex. Mrs. William has got into his confidence, but that's quite different. They all confide in Mrs. William. They all trust her. A man, sir, couldn't have got a whisper out of him, but woman, sir, and Mrs. William combined. There is good sense and delicacy in what you say, William, returned Mr. Redlaw, observant of the gentle and composed face at his shoulder, and laying his finger on his lip, he secretly put his purse into her hand. Oh, dear, no, sir, cried Milly, giving it back again. Worse and worse! couldn't be dreamed of. Such a staid, matter-of-fact housewife she was, and so unruffled by the momentary haste of this rejection, that an instant afterwards she was tidily picking up a few leaves which had strayed from between her scissors and her apron when she had arranged the holly. Finding, when she rose from her stooping posture, that Mr. Redlaw was still regarding her with doubt and astonishment, she quietly repeated, looking about the while for any other fragments that might have escaped her observation. "'Oh, dear, no, sir. He said that of all the world he would not be known to you or receive help from you, though he is a student in your class. I have made no terms of secrecy with you, but I trust to your honour completely.' "'Why did he say so?' "'Indeed, I can't tell, sir.' said Milly, after thinking a little, because I am not at all clever, you know, and I wanted to be useful to him in making things neat and comfortable about him, and employed myself that way. But I know he is poor and lonely, and I think he is somehow neglected, too. How dark it is! The room had darkened more and more, there was a very heavy gloom and shadow gathering behind the chemist's chair. "'What more about him?' he asked. "'He is engaged to be married when he can afford it,' said Milly, "'and is studying, I think, to qualify himself to earn a living. I have seen a long time that he has studied hard and denied himself much. How very dark it is!' "'It's turned colder, too,' said the old man, rubbing his hands. "'There's a chill and dismal feeling in the room. "'Where's my son, William? "'William, my boy, turn the lamp and rouse the fire.' "'Milly's voice resumed, like quiet music, very softly played. He muttered in his broken sleep yesterday afternoon after talking to me, this was to herself, about someone dead and some great wrong done that could never be forgotten, but whether to him or to another person I don't know, not by him I am sure. And in short, Mrs. William, you see, which she wouldn't say herself, Mr. Redlaw, if she was to stop here till the new year after this next one, said Mr. William, coming up to him to speak in his ear, has done him worlds of good, bless you, worlds of good. All at home, just the same as ever, my father made us snug and comfortable, not a crumb of litter to be found in the house if you were to offer fifty pound ready money for it. Mrs. William apparently never out of the way, yet Mrs. William back 
backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, up and down, up and down, a mother to him. The room turned darker and colder, and the gloom and shadow gathering behind the chair was heavier. Not content with this, sir, Mrs. William goes and finds this very night when she was coming home, why, well, it's not above a couple of hours ago, a creature more like a young wild beast than a young child, shivering upon a doorstep. What does Mrs. William do but brings it home to dry it and feed it, and keep it till our old bounty of food and flannel is given away on Christmas morning? If it ever fell to fire before, it's as much as ever it did, for it's sitting in the old lodge chimney, staring at ours as if its ravenous eyes would never shut again. It's sitting there at least, said Mr. William, correcting himself on reflection, unless it's bolted. Heaven keep her happy, said the chemist aloud, and you too, Philip, and you, William. I must consider what to do in this. I may desire to see this student. I'll not detain you longer now. Good night. I thank ye, sir, I thank ye, said the old man, for Mouse, and for my son William, and for myself. Where's my son William? William, you take the lantern and go on first, through them long dark passages as you did last year and the year afore. <laughs> I remember, though I'm eighty-seven. Lord, keep my memory green. It's a very good prayer, Mr. Redlaw, that of the learned gentleman in the peat beard with a rough round his neck. Hangs up second on the right above the panelling, in what used to be, for our ten poor gentlemen commuted, our great dinner hall. Lord, keep my memory green. It's very good and pious, sir. Amen. Amen. As they passed out and shut the heavy door, which, however carefully withheld, fired a long train of thundering reverberations when it shut at last, the room turned darker. End of part one of chapter one.